The kernel is a computer program that is at the very heart of a computer's operating system with complete control over everything in that system. After the bootloader has completed its instructions, the kernel is loaded into memory. It handles the rest of the startup as well as input output requests from the software, translating them into data processing instructions for the central processing unit, or CPU. It handles memory and peripherals like keyboards, monitors, printers, and speakers. You are watching episode 3 of the Layman's Guide to Linux, and today we are discussing the kernel right now on Spatry's Cup of Linux. Before I start today's exercise, I would like to take a moment to thank the following contributors for their financial support of this channel. Dan, Gregory, Nicholas, and Sam, this one's for you. Thanks for your support. We have a lot of ground to cover today, and in keeping with the original intention of this series, I will be briefly covering the core components of the Linux kernel. This is not meant to be a complete or exhaustive analysis. With that out of the way, let's begin. Two main types of kernels exist, monolithic kernels and microkernels. A monolithic kernel runs all the operating system instructions in the same address space for speed. A microkernel runs most processes in user space for modularity. We could think of it this way. Linux uses the monolithic kernel, and the herd from the GNU project uses the microkernel. Proprietary operating systems like Windows and Mac use hybrid kernels. The hybrid kernel approach combines the speed and simpler design of a monolithic kernel with the modularity and execution safety of a microkernel. Now, as you can see from the illustration, the monolithic kernel appears to have the simplest design. It does, however, have the largest footprint and the most complexity over the other types of kernels. This is a design feature which was under quite a bit of debate in the early days of Linux and still carries some of the same design issues. One thing that the Linux kernel developers did to get around those issues was to make kernel modules which could be easily loaded and unloaded at runtime, meaning you can add or remove features of your kernel on the fly. This can go beyond just adding hardware functionality to the kernel. It can also allow the entire kernel to be replaced without needing to reboot your computer in some instances. Now we move on to the components of the kernel. And the first one I would like to discuss is kernel modules. Did you ever load a live disk image and discover that your peripherals were operational without installing any drivers? One thing which makes the Linux kernel unique is the fact that it can power many of your devices out of the box. This is performed by the use of kernel modules. Kernel modules are essential to keeping the kernel functioning with all of your hardware without consuming all of your available memory. A loadable kernel module, or LKM, typically adds functionality to the base kernel for things like devices, file systems, and system calls. LKMs have the file extension .ko and are typically stored in the slash lib slash modules directory. Because of their modular nature, you can easily customize your kernel by setting modules to load or not load during startup with the menu config command or by editing your slash boot slash config file. Or you can load and unload modules on the fly 
with the mod probe command. I'm sure you've seen that on the forums many times. Third party and closed sourced modules are available in some distributions like Manjaro or Ubuntu. The developer of the software only provides the pre-compiled drivers without any source code. Some distributions will not include these proprietary files as they feel it taints the kernel with non-free software. The community has been quite clever at developing free versions of the drivers. However, some would argue that they do not offer the same level of functionality as the non-free offerings. Another feature of the Linux kernel is in how it manages memory. The essential requirement of memory management is to provide ways to dynamically allocate portions of memory to programs at their request and free it for reuse when no longer needed. This is critical to any advanced computer system where more than one single process might be underway at any given time. Several methods have been devised to increase the effectiveness of memory management. You have the memory chips on your motherboard and you have space allocated on your hard drive for swap or virtual memory. Virtual memory systems separate the memory addresses used by a process from the actual physical addresses, allowing separation of process and increasing the size of the virtual address space beyond the available amount of RAM using aforementioned swap space. The quality of the virtual memory manager can have an extensive effect on overall system performance. Although some may say that's quite new considering the amount of memory many modern systems have these days. But then, you know, if you don't have that swap file, you're not going to be able to do any hibernation. Next on our tour of the Linux kernel, we will briefly discover its network capabilities. The network stack is what allows the applications to be able to access a network through a physical networking device. Networking devices can be modems, cable modems, ISDN, Wi-Fi devices, or Ethernet cards. Simply put, there are seven layers to the network stack. The application layer is part of the user space, or what you see on the screen and interact with. The next five layers are the in the kernel space, which contains a system call interface, protocol agnostic interface, network protocol, device agnostic interface, and the device driver. And the seventh layer is your physical hardware. Jobs performed on the network stack are twofold. One, the user makes a request to the network, such as searching for a file. And two, when the request is filled, the data is returned to the user. The request starts from the application, such as a web browser, and goes down through the aforementioned layers to the physical hardware. At this point, the request exists as a data packet on the network medium. Once the request is received at the file location, the file is sent back to the requesting system. And once received at the requesting system, the data packets enter the physical hardware and go back through the various layers until it reaches the application layer. And at the application layer, the web browser is given the requested file, and then the user can open it. Next, on our tour of the Linux kernel, we briefly explore the process management capabilities. Now, there are two types of processes in Linux. The first, foreground processes, also referred to as interactive processes. These are initialized and controlled through a terminal session or by activating a desktop file from the menu. In other words, there has to be a user connected to the system to start such processes. They haven't started automatically as part of the system functions or system services. And the second 
is background processes, and we're going to be covering that a lot in the next episode. Background processes, also referred to as non-interactive or automatic processes, are processes not connected to user commands. They don't expect any user input. There are several types of background processes called daemons. They are started as system tasks and run as services spontaneously. However, they can be controlled by a user via an init system, such as System 5 init, or the widely adopted System D. Because Linux is a multi-user system, meaning different users can run various programs on the system, each running instance of a program must be identified uniquely by the kernel. And a program is identified by its process ID, also known as PID, and you may have seen that in your uh, file managers before, as well as its parent process ID, or PPID. Therefore, processes can further be categorized into parent processes. These are processes that create other processes during runtime. And then there's child processes. These processes are created by other processes during runtime. During execution, a process changes from one state to another, depending on its environment or circumstances. In Linux, a process has the following possible states. It can be running. Here, it's either running or it's ready to be run. It's waiting. The process is waiting for an event to occur or for a system resource. It could be stopped. And in this state, a process has been stopped, usually by receiving a signal. And then, of course, my favorite, zombie. <laughs> Here, a process is dead. It has been halted, but it is still it still has an entry in the process table. Next, we move on to the virtual file system. Now, the virtual file system is an interesting aspect of the Linux kernel because it provides a common interface abstraction for file systems. The VFS provides a switching layer between the system call interface and the file systems supported by the kernel. And to date, there are many of them. You've got ext3, ext4, Reaser, BetterFS, it reads your NTFS drives, and more. At the top of the virtual file system is a common API abstraction of functions such as open, close, read, and write. And at the bottom of the VS, VFS are the file system abstractions that define the upper layer functions and how they are implemented. These are plugins for the given file system. Below the file system layer is a buffer cache, which provides a common set of functions to the file system layer, independent of any particular file systems. This caching layer optimizes access to the physical devices by keeping data around for a short time or read ahead so the data is available when needed. Below the buffer cache are the device drivers which implement the interface for the particular physical device. And finally, on our tour of the Linux kernel, we will explore the system call interface. The system call is the fundamental interface between an application and the Linux kernel. System calls are how a program enters the kernel to perform some task. Programs use system calls to perform a variety of operations, such as creating processes, doing network and file operations, and much more. In most systems, system calls can only be made from user space processes, while in other systems, privileged system code also issues system calls. The architecture of most modern processes involves a security model. However, 
many normal applications obviously need access to these components. So, system calls are made available by the operating system to provide well-defined, safe implementations for such operations. The operating system executes at the highest level of privilege and allows applications to request services via system calls, which are often initiated via interrupts. An interrupt automatically puts the CPU into some elevated privilege level and then passes control to the kernel, which determines whether the calling program should be granted the requested service. If the service is granted, the kernel executes a specific set of instructions over which the calling program has no direct control, returns the privilege level to that of the calling program, and then returns control to the calling program. And there you have it. Wow, I can't believe we covered all of this material in one episode initially. When I was putting this together, I thought I was going to have to do this in two episodes, and amazingly, uh, I was able to get what I believe to be a, a fairly good description uh, together for you guys to whet your appetite to learn more. And if you really do wish to learn more, please click the link in the description, and you'll get uh, links to all the references that I used to put this together. And if you find the information in this series to be useful to you, please consider supporting us by pointing your web browser to cupoflinux.com and hitting the donate button. Join us next time on the Layman's Guide to Linux, where we will discuss background processes called daemons. And until then, peace out.